Matthew Whitaker on piano, Franklin Franklin keyboard, Franklin Rankin on guitar, Oren Maximov on bass, and Dominique Gervé drums, and their leader Dee Dee. Thank you. And thanks too to the Harlem School of the Arts, President and CEO Yvette Campbell, Janice Savin Williams, Vice Chair. Judith Insel, music director, and Amadea Edwards, the director of operations. And a warm welcome to all of you lovers of jazz gathered here today in a place where history happened at 312 West 77th Street to honor and to celebrate the legendary jazz trumpeter and one of the most influential musicians of the 20th century, Miles Dewey Davis III, at the site of his residence from 1960 to 1983. I'm Barbara Lee Diamond Stein Spielvogel, the chair of the Historic Landmarks Preservation Center and New York City Landmarks 50. Welcome to this so deserved recognition. Here we are in the heart of the West End Collegiate Historic District, which reflects more than 100 years of architectural development. It is filled with many distinguished styles, including 19th and 20th century row houses. This house was built in 1891. And this house is where Miles Davis created some of the groundbreaking compositions that made him one of the most important jazz musicians in the world. He referred to this house several times in Miles, the autobiography. Many of you are aware that the basement behind us, where he created some of the groundbreaking compositions that made him one of the most influential musicians in the world. He referred to this house several times in Miles, the autobiography. By the way, in this basement studio, many of his innovative and Grammy winning, including the 1970 album, Bitches Brew were conceived. It was his first gold record. Our warmest thanks to all the performing artists who have assembled today to join in this tribute. And thanks to the current building occupants, Mr. and Mrs. Hans Ruteman, and to Historic Districts Council Director, where is he? Simeon Bankoff and Frampton Tolbert, the Deputy Director, for their collaboration. And to De Deborah Burchard of Landmarks 50, 
our special thanks also to council member Gail Brewer and her staff member Jesse Bodine who arranged for the sound permit, the street closing, and invitations to the neighbors, all of whom helped make this ceremony possible. And to Frank Adio, who managed to persuade Con Ed to repair this dug up street last night, the night before for today. So to all of you who have contributed so much to making this ceremony today possible, our warmest thanks. It's clear it does take a village. Our guests today include the niece, Sandra DaCosta. No, not the niece. No, I'm not the niece. The niece, Sandra DaCosta. I have a lot of producers here today. And representative of Cicely Tyson. You told me you wrote to me that there was a new. I have it in a I think. It's okay, we're happy to welcome you. She was his publicist, like a niece, almost as good as a niece. And a cousin. And, and a cousin, but not a niece. I'm going to have to let you sort out this family for you when I'm not here. Is uh, Vince here? Because I'd like to recognize him. He is definitely the nephew of Miles Davis. His name is Vince Wilburn Jr., and he's come from California. California. Yes. Thank you for joining Thanks us. For you. Now our first speaker, Quincy Troop, a distinguished poet, writer, and editor, and also the co-author with Miles Davis of Miles, the autobiography, and the author of Miles and Me, a memoir. He was the co-producer and writer of the Miles Davis radio project. Was it a seven-part project? Yes. A seven-part radio project, which won a 1991 Peabody Award. Mr. Troop will read from his book. Thank you. Thank you. This book. Okay. Today, it is a truism that the United States is a multicultural, multiracial country that is home to all kinds of racial, ethnic, cultural, and re religious persuasions and institutions. Miles Davis's music reflected all of this diversity before the word multicultural was even coined. He listened to and learned from all musical genres. His musical tastes were more than eclectic. They mirrored the changes that were happening in music all over the globe. He was like a portal on the musical internet highway for young people, many of whom came into his music on Bitches Brew and on the corner and journeyed back with him to discover John Coltrane, Charlie Parker, Duke Ellington, and Louis Armstrong. His last recording St recording sessions were for an album that would have included rap. That's why I call him a risk taker. He was never afraid of failure because failures taught him what he needed to know as much as successes did. Miles was a great instrumentalist. He had a great melodic, lyrical, and rhythmic approach to playing the trumpet. His beautiful running trumpet style has had a lasting impact on younger players. Listening to Miles play when I was younger, I was always conscious, way before I met him, of being in the presence of a great poet, one who constructed great metaphors through the medium of sound. His sound was very close to that of a human voice. It was a mysterious voice that made me dream all the time. And it wasn't just his tone that was so masterful. Miles' sense of time was phenomenal. Max Roach, the great drummer, said that Miles' basic quarter note, his time always was always there. That's why Miles was so profound, according to Roach, because he worked at that. 
and there was always an edginess about the way he played, a scary intensity and moodiness, something unpredictable. He always kept us on our toes. For at least 35 years, Miles Davis was the dominant force in jazz. He just kept listening, playing, and moving toward his own vision. He was an artist whose greatest wish was that he never become, in his own words, a museum piece under glass. His focus was always on the present and the future, never on the past. In this sense, he was the quintessential American New World artist because he knew that the future is where it is at. He knew that language, technology, instruments, everything that goes into making sound and producing music changes and that to continue to be relevant, music had to change too. He knew that nothing is forever. Everything is forever changing, being torn down or erased to make way for something new. That's just the way it is. Some critics, however, put down his later music as meaningless or trivial. They say that his many musical changes were driven by commercial reasons rather than artistic ones. But the great majority of music lovers cherished his willingness to go out there on that risky experimental edge. The late music critic Ralph Gleason and his friend got to the core of this when he wrote, quote, the greatest single thing about Miles Davis is that he does not ever stand still. He is forever being born. And like all his other artistic kin, as he changes, leaves behind one style or mode and enters another, he gains new adherence and loses old ones. Miss him at your loss. He is amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Quincy Troop, for those eloquent and descriptive words. We've asked the noted percussionist and radio host, James M. Tume, an R&B and soul musician and songwriter who worked with Miles Davis between 1971 and 1975 to introduce the renowned musicians gathered here today. He has known most of today's guests since his childhood. But first a word about the renowned musicians. Is Professor Jimmy Heath here? No. Not that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> I still like to acknowledge him having heard him in many places. Jimmy's father, um, M. Tume's father. Himself a legendary leader and sideman. And the recipient of the 2003 Jazz Masters Award. Legendary drummer Jimmy Cobb, is he here? No. Haven't seen him yet? Wallace Roney. Where is Wallace Roney? Wallace, 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 Wallace He is the hero of our day today. A child prodigy, he began playing the trumpet at age six. In 1983, he met the greatest influence in his life, <coughs> excuse me, his teacher, Miles Davis, who became his mentor. He's worked with many other jazz greats, including Ornette Coleman, Chick Corea. In fact, you can hear them both this weekend, May 18th and 19th, at Jazz at Lincoln Center. But since 1993, he has also led his own band. He's just returned from performing at the Torino Music Festival. Wallace has been a galvanizing force to organize this wonderful program. And thanks from all of us to you all. Grammy Award-winning jazz saxophonist, Gary Bartz. I know I saw him. Please come forward so everybody can see you. He first came to New York at the age of 17 to play and study and study. In 1970... <laughs> In 1970, Gary played the historic Isle of Wight Festival with Miles Davis, an event that is widely acknowledged as the largest musical event of its time, greater attendance than at Woodstock. 
Is Al Foster here? No. And I know Lee Connors is here. Lee is here, yeah. Lee Connors is a jazz composer and alto saxophonist who was one of the leading figures in the cool jazz movement. He worked with Miles Davis during the birth of the cool sessions and is known for his long melodic lines and his individualism. He's recorded dozens of albums as a band leader, recently performing before sold out crowds at the Blue Note and a recent tour in Japan. Is George Coleman here? George Edward Co Coleman, a hard bop saxophonist, band leader, and composer, is renowned for his work with Miles Davis and Herbie Hancock in the 1960s. In 2002, he recorded Four Generations of Miles, a live tribute with bass player Ron Carter, drummer Jimmy Cobb, and guitarist Mike Stern. Thanks for coming, all of you. And now, uh, George Coleman, Jr. George Coleman, Jr. here? Right, is George here? Yeah. <laughs> this is George. Is there a Jr.? Jr. Yeah, yeah. Jr. He was seven when he received his first set of drums from the jazz innovator Max Roach, to whom uh, Mr. Troop referred in his quite brilliant remarks, I think. He's been described as one of the most talented and creative young drummers on the New York jazz scene. And now I'm going to ask James M. Toomey to present the performers. Um, first of all, thank you very much uh, for this moment, Father Lee and all the people involved. Pardon me? That's good. Uh, <laughs> Can you hear me now? Okay, I don't want to sound like the commercial. But when I was first called, you know, I don't come out to these events. Most of all, mostly I'm not invited. <laughs> But when Wallace Rooney called me, I said, he said, you'll be getting a call from uh, uh, a person named Barbara Lee. And I said, okay. And I took it. But I began to rethink it, and I realized the importance of the moment. Uh, I'm not going to be long, but I'm going to try to be very specific. Miles Davis was more than music. Miles Davis was creation in motion. You know, there's three levels to the creative process. I say, first level is imitation. I don't care who you are. There's somebody, any kind of artist, a writer, a painter, a sculptor, there's somebody that did it, or you heard somebody sing, you said, I want to do it just like that. And then you mold yourself after that person. Then if you move a little further, you, you, you get into what I call emulation. Now, what is that stage? In emulation, you're still under that other influence, but you're starting to find a little more of your fingerprints. You're starting to feel a little more about who you are. And if you're fortunate, you move to the third stage, which is innovation. And that's what Miles was. Miles understood something that, in a way that no one else did, let's be honest. He changed music. Not just, not just the approach to the trumpet, but the direction of music. I sit up here and I walked in this house. And I look, I'm here with George Coleman, Lee Connors, Gary Bartz, Wallace Rooney, myself. Do you know how many years it spanned? We talk about a man who changed music over 50 years and continued to move forward, never looked back. Because he understood the creative process is about moving forward, never looking back. And uh, I'm glad to be here. And uh, I might get a little teary because I haven't been in this house in over 40 years. And uh, he's still in there. Okay? <laughs> You, can't, you can change the shape, but you can't change the substance. <laughs> oh, they, this is Miles, and I thank you so much, the owner, for opening the house up for this. But uh, I'm, I'm about finished with what I had to say, but I just want to say I, I loved him, as we all did. Miles forever. I, I, I was just reminded, I don't want to be remiss, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a brother that passed, 
that was very, very responsible for getting Miles back into the music, and that was Dr. George Butler. I don't want to forget that. This man came here every day for a year. He was an executive at CBS. I, don't, I want everybody to get the credit they should. George Coleman. Come on, better than that. You want to hold the mic and you want to talk? Uh, I'll just talk. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Good evening. I'm very happy to be here on this occasion, and uh, I'm a man of a few words. So I just want to say that when I first joined Miles Davis' band, I was very honored, and uh, I really got a lot from his music, his band, his demeanor, his spirit, and all of those positive things associated with jazz. And Mr. Quincy Troop came by the house one day <laughs> for an interview with me, and we talked about a lot of things. Some very personal, which I didn't divulge. <laughs> and uh, that's basically all I want to say. I loved him. He was a great man. And I hope wherever he is, I'll be able to go and meet him again. And I thank all of you so much for your dedication to his music. Thank you. Wallace Rooney. Thank you, thank you. This is really an honor to um, be part of this and um, the fact that they're doing this for Miles. I know Miles would love this. And it's, it, what you're saying right now is history, in my opinion. You got the people that he really loved here. You know, there's a lot of people that could be here that's not here, but the people that that's here is the one that counts. You know, we have George Coleman, M. Tume, you know, and Miles loved M. Tume. We have Quincy True, Gary Bartz. These guys are so close. We got his nephew, Vince Wilburn, who was actually the one who actually brought him back from the retirement. I had to say that. And um, myself, you know, who I'm very honored that I was one of the, that was probably the only trumpet player that he kind of really took in. I mean, he was definitely supportive of a lot of great musicians and Dizzy was his idol and he loved a lot of great trumpet players like he told me. He liked, he mentored Lee Morgan and he liked Woody Shaw and, and Freddie Hubbard. But I think I might have been the only one he really took and let's hang around him a lot, you know. And I got a chance to learn a lot of things from him and be up close and see things, you know. I, I like to joke and say I might have been, other than Tony, Herbie, Ron, and maybe Gary and, and George, the only person he talked music to. But I was fortunate he did share a lot of things with me. And um, at the time when I, I met him in 83, and later on down the road, I started playing with Tony Williams. <laughs> And when I started playing with Tony Williams, it was funny. I played with Tony and Art Blakey. And I had a choice. I had to choose who I'm gonna play with. And this, honest goodness, the true story, of course. I'm choosing, I'm leaning to Tony, and Art really wants me in the band. So one day, Art says, uh -uh, Wallace, let's go see Miles. <laughs> so we go to see Miles. He knew I was close to Miles. So we go over to Miles' place, and I'm looking at Miles like I always look at him with my eyes wide open, and Miles is looking at Art with his eyes wide open. <laughs> Bulana, what you doing here? And then they start talking. He says, Wally, you got to stick with Bulana. Bulana's the man. 
you should hear me and Boo in 1953 telling me all this stuff. And I'm sitting up there soaking it all in and they're talking. Then finally Boo leaves and I stick around a little longer. And then I leave. Then I go on the road with Art Blakey. So we do a tour. It's cool. Then I come back and I had to make the hard decision to stick with Tony. So I go with Tony and Mom sees me and Mom says, Wally, how's Boo doing? I go, uh-uh, he, he's doing fine. I didn't want to tell him I quit. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, okay. And then we talk and then I see him again maybe a couple months later. How's the Boo? And every time I say him, every time I, I say this, I say it with a desperate voice, he's fine. <laughs> so one day, I go up to his place, and he's, hey, hey, you just walk in the door, you know, and he's standing there, he says, so, you're not with Boo Hainer anymore, and I, I'm trying to explain, well, Miles, he said, no, you left Boo Hainer, and you're playing with Tony, and I said, but, he said, oh, shit. <laughs> I know you're playing your butt off now because Tony don't like no trumpet players but me. <laughs> and that was, that was it. It was, it, it was great. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I got a million of those kind of stories, but um, it's, I'm, I'm fortunate, I'm thankful to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Alright, George. Okay. Thank you. Take care, bro. So good to see you. Good to see you too, man. Gary Bartz. Uh, probably the first time I saw Miles, I would have been about 13 or 14 years old. And I saw the band with John Coltrane, Red Garland, um, Paul Chambers, Philip Joe Jones. And I, I was already, I was all in already because of the, after I heard Charlie Parker, that did it. But to get a chance, I, I moved to New York when I was 17. I used to go down to Birdland all the time and I'd see Miles at the bar hanging out with J.J. Johnson or somebody. And the young guys, we would all stand around there and try to listen to what they were saying, you know wonder whether he knew who we were, because I met him many, many, many times. I, met, I must have met Miles about 25 times, and then about the 26 times he met me. <laughs> I was working at uh, Count Basie's with um, Max Roach, and Miles was the other band. There were two bands who were really historic occasion but I'm, I'm not going to talk too much but to me I mean Miles was he, he taught me the the essence of being a true artist because he's an artist I, I wouldn't call him even a musician he, he's an artist whose medium happened to be music but he also had other mediums that he did he was a designer he designed his house he designed his clothes he made you know i mean he did many he was a true artist that's all and one of the funniest men i've ever had the opportunity to be around yes, that's right. uh, you know that's right. That's right. i mean we laughed i was with him for two years we laughed for two years <laughs> i mean from the early morning to the last thing at night i mean he might say anything i won't even go into those stories <laughs> Those are for Why later, not? but well, uh, <laughs> we'd be here all night. But um, I just want to say that <laughs> it was a great pleasure and an honor to just be around him, much less play with him and learn from him. And we will always love Miles Davis. I'm the nephew of Miles Davis. Um, on behalf of my family, Cheryl, my, my cousin, Miles' daughter, she could not make it, and Aaron, Miles' son, he could not make it. I flew in from California, um, spent many summers here. All these these great, talented musicians are considered family. Yes, M. Tume, Wallace, Gary, um, Monty. I used to run and get steak sandwiches for Art Blakey uh, up, up on 78th and Broadway. Then I started playing with Miles in 81, The Man with the Horn. And we rehearsed it right here in this living room. So it's great to be here. I love everyone. The young brothers playing. It's beautiful. And uh, thank Barb and thank everyone for being here. Thank you. Thank you.
And now a word from the great Lee Conners. Hi, everybody. Uh, Hi. I uh, am uh, pleased that uh, last night I was at the club, uh, the Jazz Standard, where a band was playing the music of Claude Thornhill. Uh, and uh, that brings me back to 1947 when I played with the band. And now I'm here and I played with the band in 1949 and I'm beginning to feel like an old brother. <laughs> I'm very pleased to, to have this opportunity to remember Miles, who was a, really a gentle man. And uh, I appreciate very much uh, having uh, shared music with him. He actually made a record with me, in case you don't know it. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, very happy uh, to be here. Very happy to be any place. <laughs> so now we're going to have a great New York interlude. These remarkable players have decided to, I guess, give a tribute to Miles Davis, and we're here to listen and appreciate. Thank you. Before Phil Schaff speaks to conclude the program, I'm going to ask Deborah Burchard and Frampton Talbert to unveil this medallion. Where are you, Frampton? Can I help you? here, but she, she can do it. Yes. Yes. Now, can you read it, Deborah? Miles Dewey Davis III, May 26, 1926 to September 28, 1991. 
312 West 77th Street, Manhattan. American jazz musician, trumpeter, band leader, and composer, Miles Davis, considered one of the most influential musicians of the 20th century, was honored with eight Grammy Awards, a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award, and three Grammy Hall of Fame Awards. At the vanguard of major advances in jazz, including bebop, modal jazz, and jazz fusion, Davis is a groundbreaking and still revered artist whose album Kind of Blue is said to be the best-selling jazz record of all time. Davis lived here from 1960 to 1983, a creative period that encompassed his transition to a new blend of funk elements with traditional jazz. The Grammy Award-winning album, Bitches Brew, with its innovative use of recording technology, was conceived in this brownstone's basement. Released in 1970, it achieved platinum status in 2003. Davis's music, drawing upon African-American performance traditions of individual expression, has helped to shape popular music from the 1940s until today. Thank you, Deborah. And now, the widely admired Grammy winner, Phil Schaff, who, who has broadcast jazz on the radio for more than 40 years. Among his many awards are three Grammys for his groundbreaking work on Miles Davis and Gil Evans, the complete Columbia Studio recordings. Phil Schaap has taught jazz at Columbia, Princeton, and Rutgers universities, and now at the Juilliard Graduate School of Music. He's also the director of Swing University for Jazz at Lincoln Center. It is a great pleasure to introduce Phil Schaap. Thank you. Literally, I'm uh, addressing Miles Davis's congregation. We're here at his home. <laughs> Some of you actually are his people from when he was here with us in the 60s, 70s, and earliest 80s. And I'm not quite sure what a real sermon would do for you because you've heard the music, you've heard his primary associates, and you've gotten the real drill already, including the medallion that will stay here and denote that this is where Miles Davis used to hang out. But I would uh, wish to comment on the fact that, you know, Miles Davis's experience, his world, is an insight, however singular, to the soul of America. I mean, his background, you know, his grandfather was Miles Davis, an African-American who grew up in the years following slavery during that window of opportunity called Reconstruction. And it's really where black power emanates from. They tell me that uh, the grandfather was the richest man in Arkansas, and perhaps because he read the license plates, that's a joke, he moved to Illinois, uh, where he raised a family that included Miles' father and uncle who were more than just tokens as they went to Northwestern and Harvard respectively. And of course, Miles was more or less primed in this existence that we overlook of a fully arisen African-American community coming out of slavery that took part in the American dream and the Davis family realized it to the highest. Uh, I'm not the only one who heard Miles Davis say that both his grandfather and father were richer than he was that they had made some fortunes. But we were fortunate that Miles Davis turned to the arts. And a lot of you know the music in a short lesson for all of my education credits that were so nobly added to the mix here. You dig Miles Davis and that's enough of a lesson. But there was this inner need of him to recreate and to newly create. And innovation and new experiments with music is the real mantra of this artist. And in this way, he one-ups everybody. I'm sure most of you have heard of Albert Einstein. He was kind of an impressive fella, but after E equals MC square, hey, Albie, what else you got? <laughs> Miles Davis brought forward the cool school. His album, Walkin', is the most essential first step towards the hard bop period. He figured out that everybody's staying up 15 hours a day practicing to try to be like Charlie Parker and failing was foolishness. And being a conservatory man, he used modes as a way of slowing down the glib ornating of jazz improvisation and make it more lyrical and to add space and to provide the most important notes. I could take this lesson myself, the ones you don't play. 
And then he reached several new generations, of course, with the union that we call fusion. And I have a funny feeling if he had been graced with more than just, uh, he only got three score and five, the Bible says you're supposed to get three score and 10. He did a lot with those 65 years and he changed music forever, five times over. Five separate Miles Davises, each of them as noble and great as any musician who has ever lived. So, uh, you know, some of you know that Miles Davis used to, I can't really say he talked to me. He fairly, he yelled at me <laughs> a lot. And a lot of those stories I've never told, and I think that's the best thing to keep. And most of the ones that have some music in it, I've always told. But I do have one little story to tell you about me and Miles Davis. Uh, I did a Louis Armstrong festival the year after I did a Miles Davis festival. We were on the air for weeks and weeks playing Miles in 1979. I came right back with Louis the year after. And we had these t-shirts. And you know, in the early 80s, I had my Louis Armstrong festival t-shirt. And on July 4th, we play Louis Armstrong around the clock. And in those days, I was younger and able to stay up ridiculous hours, now only foolish hours I can stay up for. And I would do a midnight to 2 p.m. shift coming out of July 3rd. And it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon on the 4th of July. And since we're outdoors in a summer-like day in Manhattan, you know this town is empty on the 4th of July. Everybody's out. And there, there used to be Miles Davis-like barbecue. And there used to be this barbecue place called Smokey's. The musicians liked, it's been closed a long time, but the musicians liked Smokey's and there was a lot to like about it. And the best time to go there was when it was empty. And it's really empty at three o'clock in the afternoon on the 4th of July. I'm gonna eat, I'm gonna go to sleep, I'm gonna leave the radio on, listen to Louis Armstrong. I go into Smokey's, I'm the only customer in the joint. I go up to the counter I'm starting to put in my, it was sort of like a cafeteria style joint. And uh, Miles Davis walks in. He's got the same idea. <laughs> He's hungry, it's good food, there's nobody who's gonna bother him, and there I am spoiling him. <laughs> so he walks over to me, I'm waiting for my water at the cashier, and he sees that he liked t-shirts, cool t-shirts, and I'm wearing one with Louie, and it looks different, and it's a good t-shirt. He stares at the t-shirt, then he stares up at me. And he realized, I don't really know this cat, but I realized I must have come across him somewhere along the line. Then he stares back down at the Louis Armstrong picture on the t-shirt, stares back at me, stares at Louis, <laughs> stares back at me, and then looking right at me, he said, go away. <laughs> so I'm gonna go away. We're all going to go away. Someday this building is going to go away. Miles Davis and his art is going to be around forever. Thank Good afternoon. Thank So now you've heard this really remarkable program from the Giants of Jazz, yeah. and we're lucky to have heard you all. Thank you again. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Let's and our thanks to each and all of you for joining us today. It has been a special Only in New York interlude to celebrate the legendary Miles Davis and his remarkable colleagues. We deeply appreciate the outstanding musicians who've gathered here to pay homage to, pay, to Miles Davis. And we deeply appreciate all of you who have gathered here to join in this commemoration. <laughs> Yeah, right, yeah, right. I'm holding it very carefully.